uh, how they use medical terminology. So the objective of this lecture is first to interpret key roots, prefixes, and suffixes to give you a background on how to approach medical terminology, to apply important anatomic terminology to be able to discuss your findings uh, with other medical professionals, to recognize the importance of acronyms in medical practice and when to use them and when not to use them, and then to apply common medical acronyms, abbreviations, and colloquialisms, and most importantly, be able to use resources to help improve health literacy. So when I think of medical terminology, I think of it as being lost in a foreign country. Um, and I don't know how many of you guys have seen this show, um, but I highly recommend it. Um, it's, it's very funny, but I think that the, the piece that's sort of most pertinent is you really do send this, this guy just to, to regions where he's totally uncomfortable. Um, and it's not just a language barrier. Um, so it's not just a foreign language, it's a foreign country. Um, so it's a language barrier um, where people are talking rapidly. Not only do they talk rapidly, but they use a lot of abbreviations. Even if you figure out the abbreviations, you still don't know what the terms mean. And even if you have to figure out the terms, then they're attached to diseases that you don't understand. Beyond that, customs are different between different medical professionals. Um, so if you talk to me versus if you talk to a surgeon versus if you talk to a psychiatrist versus research personnel, the customs are all totally different. And then beyond that, hospitals in general are just confusing places. I don't know how many of you guys have been in the basement of the Stanford Hospital, um, but it is easy to get lost there. So I'd like to start off just with the basics. So almost all medical terminology comes down to just word components. So you have a root, which is the central topic of the word. It's the disease, procedure, or body part you're referring to. And then you have the prefix, which is a modifier before the word root, which generally focuses on giving additional anatomic uh, information or specifying time or quantity. And then you have the suffix. And the suffix is a modifier after the word root, which provides additional information on what's occurring during the word root, with the word root, excuse me. And the way that I think of this, uh, this is basically working backwards. So the suffix kind of gives you what you're doing to the root, and then the prefix, prefix just adds additional modifiers. So in the case of demystify, it's to cause a secret to be removed, um, which is what we hope to do with this talk. Often these words also have combining vowels um, just to make the word flow better. Um, and so often that's an O or an I um, to try and make sure that you can actually say the word. So let's go ahead and start with prefixes. And when I hear prefixes, I always think of this Dr. Seuss book. So one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish, um, where they're just sort of modifiers to the central piece. Um, so a lot of these denote quantity. Um, so you can have a unicycle or a bicycle. And I particularly love this one because that lady is so happy. You can have a tricycle. This is actually a quadricycle, uh, but we're gonna call it a tetracycle. Um, and the reason I don't include quad is because quad is actually a word root, uh, whereas tetra is a prefix. You can have a few bicycles, so oligocycles, or you can have many uh, bicycles, so polycycles. And I would argue this is too much. Um, so you can call it hypercycles. You can have small bicycles, microcycles. And again, I think this one's just a little too small. Uh, so this would be a hypocycle as well. And then you can have really large bicycles, so macrocycles. The other thing that prefixes do is they can denote location and time. So abduction versus adduction, abduction versus abduction, tell you what direction a body part is moving relative to center, where abduction is moving away and adduction is moving towards. Ambi uh, speaks to sort of what, uh, what sides you're using, and Ambi generally talks to both sides. So an ambidextrous person can use both their hands. Anti and post uh, are sort of, or pre and post uh, define uh, locations and time. Um, so I don't know what Malone is, but it really messed this guy up. 
And then Eck and Endo can speak to where something is relative to where it should be. Um, so for instance, an ectopic pregnancy is a pregnancy that is outside of where it's supposed to be. So an ectopic pregnancy occurs in the fallopian tube, uh, whereas an endotopic pregnancy, which we just call pregnancy, um, is within the uterus. They also denote location relative to objects. Um, so these are abdominal aortic aneurysms. And it's very important to know where the abdominal aortic aneurysm is occurring. Um, and we use prefixes to define that. So abdominal aortic aneurysms occur, again, in the abdomen. So here you have your diaphragm right here. Um, and below that, you have your aorta. And then these are your renal arteries. And we talk about abdominal aortic aneurysms relative to the renal arteries because that determines how you're going to repair it. So you can imagine if you try to repair a suprarenal abdominal aortic aneurysm, which involves the area above as well as below the renal artery, the chances that you're going to cut off that renal artery and cause significant damage to your kidneys is really high. Whereas with a juxtarenal or a pararenal uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm, that risk is still high because it's right next to the renal arteries but it's lower and can be repaired slightly easier. And then infrarenal abdominal aortic aneurysms, which are below the renal artery, um, are much less likely to cause issues when you repair them. You can also have qualitative prefixes, um, which tell you sort of whether something is normal, abnormal, the shape of it, whether it's supporting it, et cetera. So an antibody, um, is a protein that attacks other proteins or antigens. If you have an autoantibody, it's antibodies that attack yourself, causing autoimmune disorders like systemic lupus or erythematosus or rheumatoid arthritis. Um, you can also use the word you for normal, no pun intended, um, and then dis for abnormal. And mal is abnormal, but in a bad connotation, um, which I would say this is. Morpho is used to denote shape. So for instance, a morphologic diagnosis is a diagnosis based on either uh, imaging, and, imaging anatomy um, or pathology, uh, where they actually look at it grossly as sort of a, a cutout and under the microscope. So it's a diagnosis based on the shape of the lesions. And then pseudo speaks to false. So this is another example where it's important to understand the anatomy of an aneurysm. Um, so a normal aneurysm should have bulging of all three linings of the blood vessel. So the blood vessel has three linings in its wall, and a true aneurysm has all three of those bulge out. Whereas a pseudo aneurysm or a false aneurysm just has a break in that um, wall, and then a single lining where the other two are left behind. Now, this is really, really important because a pseudoaneurysm is much more likely to break and requires more urgent repair in many cases uh, because that lining is so thin relative to a true aneurysm. So this is just a summary of those prefixes. Um, and if you guys have the terminology worksheet, you should have a copy of this as well. And again, these are not comprehensive. It's just to give you an idea of how these can be used. So with that, let's go ahead and move on to suffixes. So suffixes, um, I think of as sort of the sauce. Um, so you have pasta, and pasta on its own is relatively bland. Um, but with sauce, you can do a lot of different things with it. Um, so you can add an Alfredo or a marinara or a pesto. And those are entirely different meals. And suffixes are very much like that, where they modify the root in a way to totally change what you're doing to that root. So let's use myo as an example. So for instance, myalgia um, is pain uh, within a muscle group. Um, and most commonly, you'll see that in the back, the shoulders, 
and the quadriceps. Whereas myositis is inflammation within the muscle. Um, and there are a number of different causes of this. But what I'm trying to show here are blood vessels within the muscle tissue that are breaking that apart, causing inflammation. Um, and generally, this presents with weakness. So examples of this are inclusion body myositis, polymyositis, et cetera. Or you can have myomas. So oma meaning tumor. And a myoma is a tumor of the muscle. And the most frequent of these are uterine myomas or fibroids. Um, and this is picturing that. And these can become very large and very problematic. It can also be used for procedures. So for example, a myectomy is when you actually surgically remove a piece of the muscle. So here's a picture of a myectomy used for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is a condition where the muscle in the heart becomes too large and therefore it obstructs blood flow getting into the aorta. To fix that, we actually go in and we will surgically remove a piece of that muscle to open up the outflow tract into the aorta. You also have a myotomy, which is an incision in the muscle. So this is a picture of what's called a Heller myotomy, um, which is a procedure in which we go in and cut a hole in the muscle all the way down to the mucosa and then put a patch over it. And the reason that we do this is for a condition called achalasia. And that condition is a condition in which the lower esophageal sphincter, which is the connection between the esophagus and the, and the um, stomach, uh, becomes too large and becomes too stiff. And to fix that, we actually cut into that muscle to try and loosen it up and allow people to swallow more normally. Suffixes can also denote actions that are occurring on that object. Um, for instance, we'll use heme or hemato as examples here. So hemolysis, which is the breakdown of blood cells. And what I'm showing here are red blood cells with a schistocyte. And a schistocyte is a red blood cell that has been sheared um, and can be sheared by a number of causes. For example, if you have a mechanical valve in your heart, that mechanical valve will actually cut blood vessels as they try and pass through it. Or if you have a condition known as disseminated intravascular coagulation, where your platelets become uh, very stiff and build up in the blood vessels, that will actually cause shearing of the blood vessels to, to go through. And seeing the schistocyte is a sign of hemolysis, um, which is a very important condition to recognize. Or hematology, which is a study of blood. Um, or here is a picture of hemago hemophagocytosis. Um, so hemo, blood, um, phage, which is eating, and site, which is cell. And so this picture here is a macrophage, which is this sort of light purple here, which has eaten a whole lot of blood cells. Um, and this, this happens to protect our bodies, um, to try and prevent diseases, um, as well as to eat up things that have been, uh, that are no longer necessary in the body. Here you have a picture of hematopoiesis. Um, so poiesis means production. So this is production of blood cells. And so a hematopoietic stem cell is a stem cell that can go on to produce all of the important blood cells that you might need, including lymphoid, which are your B cells, T cells, and natural killers, your antibody producers. Um, and then your myeloid uh, cells, such as your neutrophils, which are sort of your first line of attack uh, uh, in the body. Now, it is important to note that not every word requires a root, um, particularly when it denotes actions. So for instance, aphasia um, is A, which is none, and then phasia or speech. So it's a condition where people are unable to speak um, and generally is the result of a stroke um, is the most common thing. You can also have aplasia or, H or atrophy, which is lack of growth. Um, so you can see here a picture of a normal muscle 
versus a muscle which has had sort of negative growth um, that has shrunk due to the lack of growth. And you can have apnea. Um, so new re refers to breathing. Um, and so apnea is lack of breathing. Um, and the most common cause of this is sleep apnea, where you have a uh, soft tissue in the throat, uh, most, most often due to obesity, um, that causes the throat to close while you're sleeping and shuts down your ability to breathe. So this is just a list again of the suffixes as well as sort of what they do. Again, in no way comprehensive, but I hope this sort of helps to uh, ground our discussion moving forward. And then we get to the roots. And the roots are really the meat of the word. Um, so this is what everything else is acting on and sort of the central topic. It grounds you in uh, the sort of part of medicine that you're in, um, as well as the systems that are involved with. So this is just a list of general medical roots. Um, and you can see there are a number of examples. So bradycardia and tachycardia refer to being slow or fast. Um, sten is narrow. Um, adeno is a gland. And then carcino is cancer. I'm not going to go through all of these. I just want to make sure that that you have sort of a grasp of these and how we use them. I think it's better to use roots just with you guys practicing. I've also split them up into sort of subgroups um, based on the system that is involved. And again, each system and each specialty is going to have a lot more of these. The hope here is just to give you a broad understanding of how we use these roots and sort of the, the typical ones you'll see day to day within each system. So with that, I'd like to go on to some examples. Um, so I'm gonna pull up the chat. And what I have here is a word with prefixes, suffixes, um, and roots. And I'm gonna give everyone about 30 seconds to go through them. And then I just want you to type up in the chat uh, what you think it might be, okay? Yeah, so I think everyone sort of came to this. Um, so you're using the root meninges, as well as the suffix itis, which refers to inflammation of the meninges. And the meninges are the lining of the brain. Um, now, I think that this is sort of a common um, difficulty uh, is you sort of have cephalo um, and cerebrum, which speak more to the, the brain versus the meninges, which like you guys said, are the lining of the brain. And so meningitis is generally a bacterial infection of the lining of the brain um, and occurs very commonly, unfortunately, in children and elderly um, and is a very serious infection that's diagnosed by lumbar puncture um, and then is treated with aggressive antibiotics. So next up we have otalgia. Yeah, so I think all of you guys got it. So um, oat is ear and alga speaks to pain. So this is pain of the ear. It can speak to both inner and outer causes. So you can have uh, otitis externa, which is sort of the outer ear. You can have otitis media, which is the middle part of the ear. 
And then you can have otitis. Um, sorry, I'm blanking on the last one, but all of them lead to inflammation of the ear, uh, which results in uh, uh, pain in that ear uh, or otalgia. Next one we have is anencephaly. Yeah, so I think I think most people sort of got to it. So an is absence and cephal is head. Um, so an and cephaly is an absence generally of the portion of the skull. Um, and yes, sorry, uh, yeah, you can go ahead and type the answers in the chat. Um, is an absence of the portion of the skull, and it's a congenital condition um, that that patients can present with, and generally um, is is fatal at birth, unfortunately. All right, so next is muscular dystrophy. Yeah, so I think that's exactly right. So what you're looking for is this, which is abnormal and trophy growth. Um, and it is actually a kind of important differentiation here. So it is truly abnormal growth of the muscle. Um, so what you actually see in muscular dystrophy and the most common cause of muscular dystrophy is Duchenne muscular dystrophy, um, which is an X-linked recessive gene. Um, is not that people don't have muscles, but it's abnormal growth of those muscles. So commonly what you see at young age is this thing called pseudo hypertrophy of the calf muscles. And so you can see these calf muscles are very enlarged. And the reason for that is because the muscles are not growing correctly. So they're being filled with fat and fibrous tissue. So it truly is abnormal growth of the muscle that results in this uh, eventual weakness. Um, and it's involving, unfortunately, all muscles. So generally, patients with muscular dystrophy uh, tend to die of cardiac or lung condition due to the, the lack of muscles around that. So next we have apraxia. Yeah, so this is another one where uh, it truly is, it's absence of movement. Um, and it's, in particular, it's an inability to perform certain movements. And so apraxia is a result of generally neurologic conditions, uh, things like Parkinsonism and strokes that result in inability to perform generally like certain actions. So for instance, for Parkinsonism, you have a lot of difficulty with uh, buttoning your shirt. Um, often have difficulty with that. And then certain, uh, certain stroke patients can have those difficulties as well as um, difficulties with combing hair, things like that. Next up, we have hyperalgesia.
Yeah, no, that was absolutely excellent. So hyper is too much. Alja is pain. And then I saw a question about the Asia. And so Asia generally refers to a syndrome. So I would call this a syndrome of increased sensitivity to pain. And what you'll often see is very point tenderness. Um, so there are a lot of conditions that can cause this. Um, so uh, neurologic conditions um, that result in damage to the sensory nerves uh, can cause extreme sensitivity in certain areas of your body. Um, fibromyalgia is a condition where you have extreme point sensitivity in certain areas of your body. Um, and then chronic regional pain syndrome is another condition where often people will have, um, even to very light touch, even to sort of light breezes, uh, can feel extreme pain. Um, and that would be termed hyperalgesia. And then we'll get into some more complex stuff. So the retropharyngeal space. Yeah, so that's exactly right. So the retropharyngeal space is the space behind the pharynx, and the pharynx is the throat. Um, so the space behind the pharynx is called the retropharyngeal space. And it should be a potential space. There really shouldn't be much there. So it's supposed to be a sort of lining between two fascial planes, um, and there shouldn't be anything there. But if you have an infection in your throat or in your pharynx, um, so like pharyngitis, sometimes it can creep into that retropharyngeal space. And the important part of that is that the retropharyngeal space basically has a direct uh, connection between the uh, pharynx all the way down into the mediastinum. So if you get a retropharyngeal space infection, it can cause mediastinitis, um, which is a really severe infection around the heart. Um, Next up, we have keratoplasty. Yeah, so I think everyone is is there. Um, and is this enough time? I'm also happy to take longer time for people to sort of look through and make sure that they really get through this. Um, so let me know in the chat if, if you guys want more time. Um, but yeah, so this is keratoplasty, which is a surgical repair of the cornea and usually refers to transplant of the cornea. Um, so here's an example of a corneal transplant. Um, and you can actually see the, the sutures that have been used to, to put it in place. Um, so it's a really wild surgery um, that they can do. Um, it is important to note that Corretto not only speaks to cornea, um, but also speaks to, to like horny tissue. Um, so keratocytes are also the, the cells in your uh, skin. Um, that are very rough and prevent water from getting in. Oh, thank you, Linda. Exophthalmos. Yeah, so those are really good points. So this is one of those tricky ones where it's a little tough to figure out exactly what the root and what the um, 
uh, prefix is. So in this case, what it's referring to is ophthalmo, which is eye, and then X is out. And so everyone's exactly right. So it's bulging of the eye. Um, and this is a good example of it. And it's most frequently seen in a condition called Graves' disease. Uh, so Graves' disease uh, is a condition where you have autoantibodies that overactivate the thyroid gland, uh, causing hyperthyroidism. At the same time, those autoantibodies affect the soft tissues in the eye, and those soft tissues swell up and then can cause bulging in the eye. So exophthalmos is a very common condition um, that you see with Graves' disease and actually does determine treatment as well. So it's very important to identify exophthalmos if someone comes in with Graves' disease uh, because those patients are patients that you generally uh, want to be very careful uh, about how you treat them because radiation can actually make them worse. Um, so you want to be very, very careful. All right, tracheostomy. Yeah, so this is exactly right. So this is an opening in the trachea. So stomy um, speaks to opening. So you can have an ostomy, um, which for instance is a, a, a opening of bowel into the, uh, through the skin, uh, which is used to divert um, feces when you uh, are surgically repairing something um, or when you're not able to connect the intestines up correctly. In this case, tracheostomy is a hole in the neck through the trachea, and it's used to place a breathing tube. So a patient with a trach, which is sort of the most common thing that you hear, um, is a patient with a tracheostomy, which is a hole that goes through the neck into the trachea and allows us to place a breathing tube uh, uh, for patients who need that support chronically. Um, so yeah, that's a tracheostomy. Adenocarcinoma. Yeah, so I think everyone sort of really keyed in on the carcinoma. Um, so this is a cancerous tumor. Um, and that really is important because you can have a lot of tumors that are not a big deal. So like a lipoma is just a tumor of the fat cells um, and are very common and don't go on to, to cause any issues. But a carcinoma, a cancerous tumor, is something that you really need to focus on. An adenocarcinoma, which is a cancerous tumor composed of glandular tissue, it's the most common type of cancer. And the reason for that is because the glands are the things that turn over in your body the most frequently. So you have um, glandular tissue basically all the way through anything that's exposed to the world. So you have glandular tissue in your mouth, you have glandular tissue throughout your intestines, you have glandular tissue in your lungs, all to make sure that you maintain that interface with the world um, that allows for, for moisture, to allow for exchange of gases, food, et cetera, um, and also to allow for excretion of cells that need to fight off, uh, fight off anything that could potentially be bad for you. Um, but because of that, these tissues, these cells turn over incredibly quickly, um, and so adenocarcinoma is by far the most frequent cause of cancer that you're going to see. And this is an example of a lung adenocarcinoma. Acoustic neuroma. Yeah, so I think that's absolutely right. So um, 
Akut means ear, ner means nerve, and oma is a tumor. This is actually, it's, it's technically a benign tumor of the auditory nerves. This would not go on to cause um, uh, sort of metastatic growth or anything like that, like you would expect with a carcinoma. But it is very important because the brain and the ear in particular is such a small space. Um, the acoustic neuromas, which are nerves of the, uh, the ear nerve, uh, tumor of the ear nerve, um, can often uh, impinge on other nerves. And so often what you actually see is that the facial nerve goes right by this. Um, and so patients can sometimes uh, lose sensation or even lose um, uh, motor function on that side of their face. Uh, polyarthritis. And I promise we're almost done with these. Yeah, that's exactly right. So poly means many, arth means joint, itis means inflammation. So polyarthritis is inflammation of multiple joints. And it does help us to differentiate the causes of arthritis. So when you come to me and you say that a patient has joint swelling uh, or joint inflammation, what I'm going to ask you is how many joints? Because polyarthritis speaks to things like osteoarthritis, which is pictured here, involving basically every bone of this person's, person's hand, unfortunately. Um, uh, and rheumatoid arthritis also affect many joints. Whereas something like gout um, just affects a single joint, most classically the toe um, in podagra. Uh, sorry, podagra is the term for gout in that single toe. Um, and so that differentiates sort of a polyarthritis from a monoarthritis or a single joint. And then oligoarthritis is somewhere in between. So it affects a few joints. Um, and it speaks to uh, conditions, sort of, there are a variety of conditions that can cause that. Um, but oligoarthritis is, is important to differentiate from polyarthritis and monoarthritis in terms of etiologies. And many is kind of tough. Um, I generally define many um, as like four or five, whereas oligo is sort of two or three. Uh, but it varies depending on what you're talking about a little bit. So enterocutaneous fistula. And I'm sorry, I should say that that fistula is sort of a tract between two objects. It's just a standalone word. Yeah, so that's exactly right. So entero is intestine, cute is skin, so it's two roots. Um, and it's an abnormal connection between the intestines and the skin. So there are a number of conditions that cause this. Most frequently you see it in surgeries where unfortunately the surgery, uh, for whatever reason, it causes inflammation and then the bowel ultimately creeps out and then causes a tract between the skin and the bowel. Uh, you can also see it in conditions like Crohn's disease um, where there's so much inflammation in the bowel that it eats through those layers and causes uh, an abnormal connection between the bowel and the skin. Uh, so that's a, a common way that Crohn's patients will present. If abnormal, why do we not use this? Oh, um, so I guess, I think the abnormal part is sort of an addition that I put in. I would just call it a connection between the intestines and the skin, classically. Um, and then it's, I guess, like that is abnormal. The reason that I say abnormal in this case is because I want to differentiate it from an ostomy where we purposely put it there. And true, yeah, fistula is, yeah. 
uh, enteroscopy. Yeah, so you guys are absolutely right. So entero means intestines, scope means to observe. So enteroscopy is evaluation of the intestines with the camera. And you're absolutely right that it's a fiber optic camera. Um, so enteroscopy is uh, going all the way through the stomach and into the intestines. Uh, that sort of varies. So you can also have, for instance, a colonoscopy where you use fiber optics to view the colon. Um, this can also be done without fiber optics, right? So it doesn't necessarily speak to using fiber optics. It's just viewing. Um, so for instance, anoscopy um, is viewing the anus and it's actually done uh, just with um, a uh, sort of like almost like a wedge um, uh, to view it under direct visualization rather than with a camera. And then costochondritis. Yeah, so this is, uh, so costo is rib, conj is cartilage, and itis is inflammation. So costochondritis is inflammation of the cartilage of the ribs, which is sort of the, the connective tissue between the ribs. Um, and it's a very, very frequent cause of chest pain. Um, so if this young, good looking guy came in um, and had no heart history and came in with chest pain, the first thing I would do would be to push on his chest uh, to see if that causes the pain. Because most frequently um, in younger people with no other medical history, costochondritis is the etiology. And it can happen very randomly, just like people have muscle cramps anywhere else. Um, you can get costochondritis from a variety of things. Rhinorrhea. Yeah, so that's exactly right. So it's fluid discharge from the nose. And you guys hit the nail on the head where it's, it's really just a really fancy hoity-toity way of saying a runny nose. Um, so you can get this from seasonal allergies. You can get this from upper respiratory tract infections, um, uh, from any number of etiologies. Um, but turns out being rhinorrhea. Lithotripsy. Yeah, so that's exactly right. So lith is stone, tripsy is break apart. So lithotripsy is a procedure that breaks apart stones. And the most common way you'll see this is uh, extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy. So extra is outside, corpor speaks to the body. Um, and then you're using shockwaves to actually break apart kidney stones. You'll also see it with uh, uh, gallstones and any other uh, things that that form these stones. Uh, but the most common way you'll see it is, is in um, uh, kidney stones. And you can do it from the outside like they're doing here. And sometimes they'll use what's called laser lithotripsy, where they actually go through the bladder with another fiber optic camera and then break it up with lasers. Cholidocolithiasis.
Yeah. So that's exactly right. So coli is bile, doco is duct, lith is stone, and iasis is a condition. So this is stones in the bile duct. So the bile duct is what connects the liver, gallbladder, and the uh, pancreas together uh, to release bile, which is a really important uh, substance that allows us to, uh, to break down fat. Um, so it releases bile uh, into the pancreas to allow us to break down fat. Sometimes that bile will form stones. It's relatively normal to have stones within the gallbladder. That's very frequent. But if they sneak into the bile duct, they can cause backup and can cause a lot of pain and inflammation, and in some cases, infection, which is called cholangitis. Laparotomy. Yeah, so that's exactly right. So tomi is an incision, lapro is your abdomen. So laparotomy is an abdominal surgery with an open incision, as opposed to laparoscopy where you kind of do a closed incision. And so the classic cause of this is an exploratory laparotomy where someone comes in with a large trauma or we're not sure what's going on in the abdomen and we need to get in quickly. And so we basically open up the entire abdomen with this, this incision and take a look. And so this is a scar after an exploratory laparotomy. Myocarditis. Yeah, so you guys absolutely hit it. So myo is muscle, card is heart, itis is inflammation. So this is inflammation of the muscles of the heart, and it can be caused by a variety of different things. So what you're seeing here um, is the wall around the heart, and the wall is all made of muscle, and you see inflammation within it. Um, so myocarditis is that inflammation. Um, so it can be caused by infections. The most common infections that cause it are Coxsackie viruses. Um, or it can be autoimmune. So you can develop autoimmune myocarditis. Um, and it prevents, presents with pretty severe chest pain um, and can cause total dysfunction of the heart. So it can be very, very severe. And then ophthalmoplegia. Yeah, so that's exactly right. So ophthalmo is eye and plesia means paralysis. So it's a condition in which the eye is paralyzed. Now this is something called intranuclear, internuclear ophthalmoplegia. And it's important to note that the muscles that control the eye receive nerve inputs that sometimes affect both eyes and sometimes affect just one eye, depending on what part of the brain you're in. And so internuclear ophthalmoplegia is a condition where you have problems with adduction of the eye. So what you can see in panel A is as he's trying to look left here, this eye is not adducting correctly. Um, and then when he's trying to look to the left, or look to the right, excuse me, with this eye, this eye is not adducting correctly. Okay. So that's internuclear ophthalmoplegia. You can also have ophthalmoplegia of just one eye, and that's most commonly caused by um, the nerves immediately at that eye being affected or uh, severe inflammation in that eye. And I think this is our last one.
Yeah, so I think you guys got it absolutely right. So thoraco is thorax, scope is observe, pneumo is lung, ectomy is removal. Um, so thoracic camera guided removal of the lung under direct visual, under camera visualization, as opposed to if they did a thoracotomy where they actually uh, cut in between the ribs and then open that space up and pull it out by hand instead of with a scope. Oh, sorry, I lied there, a couple more. Yeah, so that's that's a really good point. So this is dysabnormal phasia speech. So this is difficulty expressing or comprehending speech and language, and is generally caused by a stroke. And that that it is actually important to to talk about the fact that there there can be a difference in how you talk about aphasia. So some are expressive dysphasias, uh, where they're not able to say what they want to say, um, and then others. Um, are dysphagias due to problems with comprehension, um, where what's coming in is not appropriately being uh, comprehended and therefore you can't respond to it. And then this differs from dysphagia, which we already talked about, by the fact that you have difficulty eating and swallowing due to dysfunction of the mouth and throat. So. ASIA versus AGIA uh, is a big difference. Um, and so oropharyngeal dysphagia is difficulty eating or swallowing due to dysfunction of the mouth and throat. All right, so that was actually was their last one. Um, so I leave it up to you guys. We have uh, another hour left. We have time to take a quick break if you guys would like, or we can keep rolling. No break, I love it. You guys are ready. All right, so anatomy. So I wanna talk about anatomy because this is really how doctors discuss thing, findings with each other um, and how medical professionals, excuse me, medical professionals uh, discuss things with each other. So if you tell me that someone has a rash, I'm gonna ask you where that rash is. Um, because a rash on the palms is very different from a rash on the arm, is very different from a rash in sun exposed areas, is very different from a rash that involves the entire body. And so being able to describe that in anatomic terms is really, really important. My goal here isn't to go through uh, all anatomy. I just want to be able to give you the guys the tools uh, to be able to uh, provide sort of relative information um, that you can use to discuss this. So the first thing I wanna talk about is anatomic position. So anatomic position is uh, standing face forward, uh, legs about shoulder width apart, and then palms forward. Um, and then based on this, you can provide relative information about where things are. So anterior is towards the front, whereas posterior is towards the back. Other terms for this is dorsal, which is posterior. And the way to remember that is by the fact that the dorsal fin on a dolphin is on its back. And then ventral is towards the front. Then you go up and down. So superior is towards the head and is also known as cranial. And inferior is towards the feet and is also known as caudal. Now, as you uh, sort of hit midline, as you deviate from there, you also provide additional information. So lateral is towards the side, whereas proximal, I mean, excuse me, lateral is towards the side, whereas medial is in the midline here. And then proximal and distal, I think, are what a lot of people struggle with. So proximal is closer to the origin, generally considered the trunk, and then distal is further away from the origin. And again, it's most commonly used in terms of your extremities. So your hand is distal uh, to your forearm. 
um, whereas your shoulder is proximal to your arm. You can also see it in terms of vessel imaging, so proximal to where that vessel takes off um, or distal to where that vessel takes off uh, speaks to how close to the origin of that vessel you are. Now, it's also important to know uh, the planes uh, through which we talk about, because CT scans um, use this very thoroughly. Uh, so a CT scan is when you go through that tube um, and then it provides thin cuts of the body. And those thin cuts are generally um, cut in three different ways. Um, so you have the transverse or the axial plane. So this is your transverse and this is your axial plane um, versus the coronal plane, which I always remember by the fact that corona means sun. And so you kind of look like this. Uh, so where you cut straight through the middle from side to side, from left to right. So that is the coronal plane. And then you have the sagittal plane. So this is your sagittal plane right here, where you basically cut right down the middle, front to back. And so this is your sagittal plane. Okay. And then based on that, you can only have four directions. And understanding that directionality is really important. So this is an axial or a transverse image. And so like I said, that says if you're cutting straight through the person and you're looking uh, down on it. Um, so for axial imaging, you again, basically have four directions you can go. You can go right, which is um, opposite for us because we're using anatomic positioning. So right is your left. You can use left, which is your right, anterior or ventral, and then posterior or dorsal. Then you have sagittal imaging, which again is where you cut from front to back. Um, and sagittal imaging again provides you four uh, anatomic positions that you can use. So you have anterior or ventral, posterior or dorsal, superior or cranial, and inferior or caudal. And then finally you have coronal imaging, which again, just remember the sun, uh, where you cut from left to right. Um, straight through. And so on this, you have right, which again is left because it's anatomic positioning, left, which is your right, superior or cranial, and inferior or caudal. The other thing that I just want to mention, and this is not something for you all to memorize by any means, is that most of these things are going to be using a body part as reference. Um, I can never remember most of these things. Anytime someone brings up something anatomic outside of my wheelhouse, um, I'll always look it up. But just know that most of the time they're gonna be using these body points as reference. This I actually do think is very important, um, is understanding what the important anatomic cavities are. So you have uh, a few sort of really important cavities that you need to know. So the cranial cavity, is the hole where the brain goes. The thoracic cavity is the hole where the heart and the lungs go. And within that, you have a mediastinal cavity, which is where the heart goes. And then a pleural cavity, which is where the lungs go. That is separated from the abdominal cavity as well as the pelvic cavity by the diaphragm. And together, because the abdominal and the pelvic cavity aren't actually separated by anything other than the fact that the, so the pelvic cavity is separated from the abdominal cavity by the cutoff of the pelvis, which is this, these bones right here. Um, but they're not separated by anything like a membrane, like a diaphragm or anything like that. So generally we combine these two into something called the abdominal pelvic cavity. And as long as you know those cavities, um, you'll be able to sort of figure out where almost everything is. So here's a quick knowledge check. So which is more caudal, the abdomen or the thorax? Yeah, exactly. So remember, caudal means inferior or towards the feet. And so the abdomen is more caudal than the thorax. So the thorax is superior 
or cranial to the abdomen. The abdomen is caudal or inferior to the thorax. Is the palm dorsal or ventral? Yeah, so I think everyone got that exactly right. So remember anatomic position um, is palms forward. And so your palms are considered anterior or ventral. And then which joint is more distal, one or two? Yeah, man, you guys are quick. Um, so absolutely, so distal means further from the point of origin. And so point one is your distal joint. And it's actually called that. It's called the distal interphalangeal joint um, or your DIP. And it's important to know DIP versus PIP because um, different types of arthritis affect those joints differently. So for instance, the DIP um, or the distal interphalangeal joint um, is really only affected by two diseases, which are osteoarthritis and psoriatic arthritis. Uh, whereas the PIP is affected by a ton of different uh, things. So here's our knowledge check. Um, so which anatomic plane is this? Yeah, so you guys are absolutely right. So this is uh, the axial or the transverse plane. Um, so it's as if we're cutting straight through front to back um, uh, as if we're kind of like, like a donut almost. Um, and then what side of the body is the mass on? Yeah, the right side. Um, so remember that anatomic right is your left. And then is the mass lateral or medial to the heart? I'm sorry, I'll be right back. Uh, uh, Emily Anthony? Yeah. Okay, uh, just okay. Uh, I'm sorry, I have like a call that I'm on right now. Um, yeah, can you can you bring back tomorrow? I'm so sorry. Uh, no, I'll go ahead later. Sorry, I believe you're twenty. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Sorry, sorry. Okay. Uh, so sorry, that's the issues with working from home. Um, so <laughs> this is lateral to the heart. So remember, the heart is midline. Um, so this is looking lateral to the heart. And then uh, what anatomic plane are we in now? Yeah, so this is the sagittal plane. So you cut through um, straight down the middle. And so this is your sagittal plane. And then describe the location of the food bolus. I'm sorry, I should have mentioned this is a food bolus in the esophagus. Um, so where is that relative to the spine? And remember that the spine, this white stuff right here. Yeah, so that's exactly right. So this is anterior or ventral to the spine. And then describe it relative to the heart. And so the heart is this right here. So how would you describe it relative to the heart?
Yeah, I think everyone got that absolutely right. So it's posterior or dorsal and superior to the heart. But then, so how is this used in real life? So I already talked a little bit about this, um, but it really does allow us to sort of converse with each other as far as where things are and what we're looking at. I would say that if you know your sort of anatomic positioning um, and uh, sort of simple anatomy, you can figure out the vast majority, like I would say 60, 70, 80% of uh, spots, of uh, vessels, um, and nerves just based off that. So here we have a bottom view of the brain. Right here is your cerebellum. This is your cerebrum, right? And these are all of the vessels that are involved in perfusing the brain. So here we have your posterior inferior cerebellar artery, which you can see going right here. And you can see it's perfusing the bottom and the back of the cerebellum versus the anterior inferior cerebellum, which is right here, which is perfusing the front and the bottom of the cerebellum. Same thing with the cerebrum. So the posterior cerebral artery travels towards the back of the cerebrum. The middle cerebral travels right down the middle and the anterior cerebral travels right to the front. Um, and so really, if you know what they're perfusing and what direction on the um, brain they're going, you can automatically name them um, without having to memorize a whole bunch of stuff. It also provides important diagnostic information. So here on the left are the regions perfused by your anterior, middle, and posterior cerebral artery. And then these are the regions of the brain and where they act. So for instance, the temporal lobe acts on learning, on language, and the occipital lobe acts on visual processing. So if you have a middle cerebral artery occlusion, which affects this red region right here, you're gonna affect the temporal lobe, um, and you're gonna have issues with language processing, and you're gonna have aphasia, right? Whereas if you affect the posterior cerebral artery, you're gonna affect the occipital lobe, and that frequently presents with difficulties with vision are often vision loss. It also provides diagnostic information in terms of how I approach um, presenting symptoms. So if someone comes to me with abdominal pain, the first thing I'm gonna ask is where in the abdomen is that happening? Because the location in the abdomen provides you important information um, in terms of what organs are there and what organs might be affected. So the way that we split this is based on the umbilicus and we go superior and inferior and then right and left. So for instance, uh, right lower quadrant pain um, is exactly where the appendix is. And so appendicitis is a very, very frequent cause of right lower quadrant pain. Whereas in the right upper quadrant, uh, that's most frequently going to be a liver issue or a gallbladder issue. So you can see biliary colic or gall uh, or cholecystitis, which is a gallbladder uh, infection or hepatic abscesses. It also provides diagnostic information when you look at imaging studies. So this is a picture of the mediastinum. And the mediastinum is split up into three different compartments. So you have your anterior compartment, uh, which is made up of your thymus, your thyroid tissue, fatty tissue, and lymph. You have the middle mediastinum, which is predominantly made up of your heart, um, and then the bronchuses, which are going into the lungs. And then you have your posterior mediastinum, which is made up of the nerves, esophagus, et cetera. So if someone comes to me and says that, they have a mediastinal mass, I'm gonna ask them, where is it? Is it in the middle? Is it in the front or is it in the back? And based on that, you have a differential. So an anterior mediastinal tumor, like I said, is where you have thyroid tissue and parathyroid tissue, as well as your thymus. And so you can present with uh, thyroid tumors, thymomas. You also have fat, so you can pre present with lipomas. And it's also where your lymph tissue is. So that's where you can get lymphomas. 
Um, and that's the sort of major thing we worry about when we see an anterior mediastinal tumor is Hodgkin's lymphoma. In the middle mediastinum, you can see the things that can be affected are the bronchi, so you can get bronchogenic cysts or bronchogenic tumors, um, as well as your pericardium, uh, which is the, uh, the heart. And then the posterior mediastinum, you can get neurogenic tumors because that's where all the nerves come from. And then you can also have esophageal tumors uh, because that's where the esophagus travels down. Importantly, it also provides prognostic information. So we already talked a little bit about the fact that you can use proximal and distal in terms of vessels, um, where uh, you talk about proximal and distal relative to origin. So right here we have the heart, and the heart is separated into vessels, which again, you can kind of guess what they're gonna be called. So the right coronary artery heads towards anatomic right. Um, the left main artery heads to the left, and then when it splits off, you have one that perfuses the front and travels down the heart called the left anterior descending. And then you have one that goes around the heart, which is called the circumflex artery. The most important cause of uh, uh, heart attacks um, or myocardial ischemia um, is a thrombus. Um, and they frequently affect the left anterior descending or the LAD. Um, and so that's called the Widowmaker. It's, it's a very severe thrombus. Um, and when someone tells me that they have an LED occlusion, what I'm gonna wanna know is where in the LED it is. So if it's a distal occlusion, um, such as right here or right here, you can, you can imagine that it's only gonna affect a little bit of the heart. Whereas if it's a more proximal occlusion, all the way up here, sorry, I'm having issues with my pen, but. Um, a more proximal occlusion, you can imagine that all of this myocardium is going to be affected, and it's going to be a much more severe uh, uh, heart attack um, and more likely to cause issues and provide that prognostic information we're talking about. All right, so with that, um, I think it's important to move on to medical acronyms and shorthand. So first off, why do we use medical acronyms and shorthand? Um, and I think this is a really good example. Um, so we already looked at the picture of the heart and we talked about how busy it is. Um, so this is a 65 year old woman with a past medical history of hypertension, type two diabetes mellitus, presenting with right-sided anterior inferior cerebellar artery cerebrovascular accident. Um, and when you show me that, if you sent, if you sent me, um, a note with that information, I would say, I don't have time to read this. I can't figure out what's going on. Whereas you can easily um, put this into 65 year old female, PMH of hypertension, diabetes, and a right AICA CVA. And you can immediately with these acronyms figure out exactly what's going on um, and be able to sort of take that action. So this is why we use acronyms. So these are just some examples of important acronyms um, that are used and it's heavily bent towards internal medicine and the primary care setting uh, because that's what I know and what I use most frequently. These acronyms are going to vary based on what specialty you're involved with, um, but they are important to know. Um, so the ones that you see most frequently, um, you're going to see a lot of things like AKI. So AKI, which is acute kidney injury. Uh, CAD, which is coronary artery disease, COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, CHF, congestive heart failure, um, CVA, which is a cerebrovascular accident, which is just another word for stroke, um, ESRD, end stage renal disease, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, you're going to see all the time, um, pneumonia, um, and then uh, diabetes. Uh, so you'll see T2 diabetes mellitus very frequently as well. So I think it's important to go over these by example as well. Um, so for example, this is a 84 year old female PMH of CAD presenting with a CHF exacerbation. Um, so what does that mean guys? All right, everybody, excuse me. And 
and I see, yeah, so. Yeah, so this is an 84 year old coming in with a history of coronary artery disease and congestive heart failure. Um, and then I, I saw the, the question about um, ITA and CVA. Do you mean TIA? Yeah, okay, so a TIA and a CVA, it's kind of tough. So TIA is a transient uh, ischemic attack, whereas a CVA is a uh, cerebrovascular accident. Or a stroke. Um, we used to define it based on how quickly people recovered. Um, so a TIA was if you totally recovered function within 24 hours, we called it a TIA. Um, whereas a CVA is generally you don't recover that full function um, after 24 hours. Now that strokes are predominantly diagnosed based on imaging, um, that that distinction has become pretty blurred. Um, so TIA is really just a way that we say a less severe stroke nowadays. We also use um, medical acronyms in history taking um, to, to provide that shorthand so that we're not writing out a crazy amount of words. So good examples of this um, are uh, secondary to or due to, uh, which provide information as far as what's causing the sort of central problem, chief complaint, and then we have a series of C slash slashes. So complicated by, concern for, consistent with, um, other things that you'll commonly see, so past medical history, and then uh, dyspnea on exertion is used all the time. Um, you'll also see PND, which is paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, which kind of correlates with CHF. Um, so paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea uh, is a condition where uh, when you're lying down during nighttime, you'll occasionally wake up feeling short of breath. So let's see how we can use this. Uh, so the same thing, this is that 84-year-old female, PMH of CAD, presenting with DOE and PND concern, uh, C, C slash F, CHF exacerbation. So what does that mean? Yeah, so this is an 84-year-old female. She has a past medical history of coronary artery disease. She's coming in with dyspnea on exertion and paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, um, which is concerning for congestive heart failure exacerbation. Um, so this provides the history that leads to the diagnosis that you're thinking about. We also use it all the time in prescribing. Um, so NPO is nothing by mouth, IM, IO, and IV. Um, as well as PO are different ways to deliver medication. So intramuscular versus intraosseous, which is in the bone, versus intravenous, which is in the vein, and then PO, which is by mouth. PRN is pro renata, which means as needed. Um, and then we use Q to tell you how often to take it. So QAC is before meals. QAM means in the morning. QHS means every night. BID means twice daily. TID means three times daily. Um, so this is another example. So 84-year-old female, PMH of CAD, presenting with DOE and PND, concern for heart failure exacerbation, now status post Lasix, 20 milligrams IV with improvement. Um, so how was this Lasix delivered? Yeah, exactly. So we're just sort of building up exactly what we've done to this, this, this patient. So she's 84, she came in with coronary artery disease and heart failure. Uh, well, she came in with dyspnea um, and paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, concerning for congestive heart failure exacerbation. And then we gave her IV Lasix uh, to make her pee more frequently, and that has improved her symptoms. We also use it for medications. Um, so we use a lot of shorthand for medications. The ones that you'll see most frequently are APAP and ASA, which is aspirin and acetaminophen, CTX, which is ceftriaxone, and DAPT, which is dual antiplatelet therapy. Oh, I'm sorry, I can slow down. Um, so dual antiplatelet therapy uh, is a combination of aspirin um, and another antiplatelet therapy, generally Plavix, 
or Ticagrelor, um, Berlinta. Um, you'll also see HCTZ, which is a blood pressure medication, um, and methotrexate, uh, MTX, um, and then nitro, nitroglycerin. So same thing, 84-year-old female, PMH is CAD on ASA, presenting with DOE and PND, concern for CHF exacerbation. So what medication does she take at home? Yeah, exactly. So this is aspirin. All right. So uh, next up, we have labs as well. So these are the frequent labs that you'll run into. So a CPC is a complete blood count. A diff is when we add on to the CPC. So it's CPC with differential. And you separate the number of white blood cells. Um, to provide more information on exactly what blood cells are affected. BMP is your basic metabolic panel. So it looks at electrolytes, your sodium, potassium, chloride, CO2, BUN, and creatinine. Your CMP is a comprehensive metabolic panel, which is a basic metabolic panel plus your liver function tests. So your uh, transaminases, your AST, and your ALT. Uh, COAGs are your coagulation studies. LFTs are just another word for liver function tests. And then you'll often see TFTs as well, so thyroid function tests. So same thing, 84-year-old female, uh, PMH is CAD, presenting with DOE and PND, with CMP notable for AKI and elevated LFTs with a concern for CHF exacerbation. Sorry, it's actually really hard to say, <laughs> to say the acronym. Um, so, uh, Yes. Yeah, so what they're saying here um, is providing additional information about lab data. So the CMP um, shows that the uh, creatinine is elevated, which means that this patient has an acute kidney injury, and then elevated LFTs or elevated liver function tests, which happens very frequently in CHF exacerbations um, because the heart backs up and the first thing it affects is the liver. And when the liver has that pressure buildup, it releases damaged enzymes. So a sign of a congestive heart failure exacerbation is abnormal kidney function, and then transaminitis, which is elevated liver function test. And then these are some examples of procedures that you'll frequently see. Um, so you can have an AKA slash a BKA, which is above or below the knee amputation, a BSO, which is bilateral salpingo oophorectomy, which is when you actually uh, uh, cut out the ovaries, a cath, which is a catheterization, it's where you, there are a couple of different ways you can catheterize people, but generally what we're speaking of, of with this is when we go in through the arteries and then we take a look at the coronary arteries using a catheter, which is a uh, flexible tube. Cabbage is a coronary artery bypass grafting. So it's when we bypass the coronary arteries um, with other, uh, other vessels um, to try and restore blood flow to the heart. An X-lap is an exploratory laparotomy, which is when you actually do that midline incision all the way down and open up the abdomen. PCI is just another term for a coronary catheterization, uh, so percutaneous coronary intervention. A TAH is a total abdominal hysterectomy. So there are multiple different approaches to a hysterectomy, which is a removal of the uterus. Um, and one of those approaches is when you do it from the abdominal approach. Um, so a TAH is when you remove um, the uterus through an abdominal approach. And that's often combined with the BSO. So you'll do a total abdominal hysterectomy with a bilateral esophago oophorectomy, which is a TAH BSO. It's important to differentiate that from a THA or a TKA, which are total knee arthroplasty, which is basically hip replacement, or total knee arthroplasty, which is knee replacement. Um, and then VAT, which is a video-assisted thoracoscopic surgery. So like we talked about before when we did the thoracoscopic pneumonectomy, VAT is VAT. 
So it's a video assisted thoracoscopic surgery. So same thing. Um, so what surgery did this patient have? Yeah, so you guys are all absolutely correct. So this is that same female with coronary artery disease. And this is just an, a modifier to let us know that she previously had a coronary artery bypass grafting. And then she's presenting with this heart failure exacerbation like we've already seen. Now, like I said, by no means did I provide you guys with a comprehensive um, list of acronyms and uh, prefixes slash suffixes. Um, so it's really important to know how to look these things up on your own. Um, and the best resource by far at Stanford, it's just truly wonderful, is Lane Library. And so top resources is a, is a great place to start. And if you're looking for medical information, the two places that I really, really like are up to date which provides disease-specific information about the pathology, epidemiology, diagnosis, treatment, and guidelines. Um, you can figure out management of practically any disease based on UpToDate. And then uh, Dynamed, uh, so very similar to UpToDate, uh, but written in an abridged format. So uh, the really nice thing about Dynamed is that it's kind of bulleted out and then provides level of evidence for all of their recommendations. Um, so I, I actually really like Dynamed when I'm trying to figure out like how uh, like what, what level of evidence the recommendations I'm making truly are. As far as acronyms, there used to be a really excellent resource for acronyms um, called MediLexicon, um, but unfortunately that's no longer in business. The one that I really like now is onelook.com. Um, it's, uh, it's basically just a dictionary software, but it does find most acronyms and pulls it together in a variety of different um, formats. Uh, so it'll actually, it's basically your one-stop shop for all of the different dictionaries. Um, so it'll search through all of those dictionaries to find it. So this is a great place where I'm trying, when if I'm trying to find an acronym, this is my go-to place. And then if you're looking to figure out what the lab tests are, um, I like to go uh, to the Stanford lab guide. Um, and then just type it in. So if you're like, what is a CBC? Uh, it'll pop up and then you just click on that CBC and it'll tell you exactly what the components are. Um, same thing if you're looking for an EIA or an or a, um, enzyme amino assay um, or a certain type of PCR, polymerase chain reaction. It'll all pop up uh, in the Stanford lab guide and tell you exactly what it's looking for. Um, and then these are just resources for finding prescriptions. Um, so my favorite is Lexicomp. Um, it's really great information, very comprehensive. Um, and then another option is Micromedics. I use that less frequently um, just because I, I started with Lexicomp and that's what I've been using. Uh, but Micromedics is also an excellent resource. So now I want to give you guys about uh, 10 minutes to just go through these. Um, and uh, try and pull together exactly what's going on with these patients. And ideally, I'd like you to say it as much as possible in a language for um, uh, patients with, for, not for patients, but for providers who may not understand the lexicon that we're talking about. Um, so trying to make it as simple as possible. So we'll go ahead and give you uh, to be about 10 minutes for this. Oh, I'm sorry, this did not update correctly, but I'll just time you guys.
Um, and we'll go through each one sort of separately um, and we'll sort of pull your answers. Um, so uh, feel free to hold till the end. Sorry, that wasn't clear.
Sorry, so we have about a minute left. Andrew, this is Kira. Um, okay. For everybody who's asking about apps um, that you know you can download onto your phone and, and use on the go, um, LexiComp is um, available as an app. Um, I'm not sure of the price. Um, I use this in nursing school. Um, I, I don't remember if it's free or not. Um, maybe Andrew, you can answer that. But there's also a few medical terminology um, applications that are available for free um, through the App Store. So use those um, on your mobile device. Uh, but as Andrew pointed out, there are a lot of resources through Lane Library as well. Yeah. So if if you use Lane, you actually can get most most people here can get Lexicomp for free. Um, you do have to pay for it if you're sort of outside the institution. Um, and then uh, Up to Date is also a great app. Um, that is available on the phone and really easy to look through. Um, so we're at 10 minutes. Um, I think if it's okay with you guys, um, we can move forward. If anyone would like me to hold up though, that's fine too. Everyone good to go? I'll take that as a yes. All right, um, so let's start with the first case. So um, 26 um, YOF PMH of SLE comp uh, is complicated by ESRD, polyarthritis and steroid induced T2DM, um, presenting with RUQ tenderness with elevated LFTs, concern for MTX induced hepatitis. So uh, the sort of simplified thing I gave, and most of you guys were absolutely uh, right with this. Um, so 26 year old female uh, with systemic lupus erythematosus, which is an autoimmune condition complicated by end stage renal disease. Um, so end stage renal disease is uh, when your kidneys really don't function anymore and you require uh, hemodialysis, uh, joint inflammation, uh, polyarthritis, and then steroid induced diabetes. Uh, coming in with right upper quadrant abdominal tenderness and lab findings concerning uh, for methotrexate induced liver inflammation. Um, so that's sort of that's sort of my simplified take on it. It does have um, a good amount of uh, terminology still in it. For instance, systemic lupus erythematosus. Um, but I think in, for conditions, I tend to like to use a name, uh, particularly when I'm talking to patients. Um, or to uh, 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 other providers, I'll often try and simplify uh, other terms um, as much as possible. So for this one, yeah, LFT is equal liver function test, yep. Um, so for this one, 55-year-old uh, male, um, PMH of HTN, HLD, CKD, and AFib, uh, not on anticoagulation. Um, presenting with new onset hemiplegia, concern for CVA. Um, so what this is trying to say, um, yeah, so you guys are absolutely right. So 55-year-old uh, male with a past medical history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, um, chronic kidney disease, and atrial fibrillation, who is not on anticoagulation, who presented with new onset partial paralysis, concerning for a stroke, for which he received a clot breaking medication um, through his IV uh, intravenously, um, which is TPA uh, or tissue plasminogen activator. Um, so for this case, um, so 67 uh, year old male, uh, PMH of CAD status post PCI on DAPT presenting with DOE in the setting of dark bowel movements and anemia on CBC concern for UGIB. Um, he's receiving IV protonics and NPO pending an esophagastroduodenoscopy in the morning. 
Um, so this is a 67 year old male. Um, he has a past medical history of coronary artery disease for which he received percutaneous coronary intervention. And generally patients who receive percutaneous coronary intervention um, for at least a month, and depending on the type of stent for at least a year, you have to remain on dual antiplatelet therapy, which means um, aspirin as well as another antiplatelet, generally clopidogrel or ticagrelor, um, who is presenting for shortness of breath on exertion, dark bowel movements, and low blood counts, concerning for an upper gastrointestinal bleed. Um, he's now receiving intravenous protonics, which is a medication, uh, an acid suppressing medication, and is not allowed to eat, was planned to evaluate his upper gastrointestinal system more closely with a fiber optic camera in the morning. So for this case, um, what I ended up separating into, so 45 year old female, no significant PMH presenting after motor vehicle accident with imaging concerning for rib fracture complicated by hydroneumothorax and pneumoperitoneum, now status post thoracotomy and x lab concerning recovering the ICU on a PCA. So this is a 45 year old female with no significant past medical history um, who had a motor vehicle accident resulting in air and fluid in the lung and air in the abdomen, which is concerning for trauma related to the fact that she had that rib fracture, uh, for which she underwent exploratory surgery of the chest and abdomen. Um, she's recovering well with patient controlled anesthesia, patient controlled pain management. Uh, in the intensive care unit. And so a PCA is uh, basically a pump with either morphine or hydromorphone dilated hooked up to it. And then patients push the button um, when uh, they need to receive pain medications um, when they have an exacerbation of their pain. And then a uh, 63-year-old male with a PMH of COPD on home oxygen who is presenting with cough and DOE concern for uh, PNA, now improving on IV CTX. Uh, so this is a 63-year-old male. He has a past medical history of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. He came in with fevers, cough, and, oh, I meant to say, uh, just male exertion with concern for pneumonia. Oops, sorry, guys. Uh, who's now, now improving on IV ceftriaxone, which is an antibiotic that's used to treat pneumonia. Oh, man, it's a hard habit to break. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so the... Important thing here is to make sure as well to know your audience. So you certainly don't want to speak like you write. So you saw the difficulty that I had um, with saying PNA, with saying, uh, with saying um, CAD, uh, et cetera. So you certainly don't speak using those acronyms. Um, so as you read through, you sort of convert them as you're in your head as you go. There are also abbreviations that you really should discourage. So U for units, you should just type out units. QD uh, for daily, definitely avoid it. And then MSO4, which is sometimes used for morphine, just spell out morphine. And then always remember your audience. Um, so if I'm typing something that is gonna go to another provider, I will use a ton of acronyms because it simplifies the reading for them and makes it a much more concise, easy to read summary for medical professionals. But I always use normal English when I'm talking with patients and families. Um, so I will not tell them they have hepatitis, I will tell them that they have inflammation of the liver. Um, I won't tell them that they need a PCI, I will tell them they need a procedure where we go in with a catheter to look at the heart vessels more closely and intervene on them if we need to. Um, so always try and uh, make sure that you are appropriate to your audience. And it's important to know that patients really are not health literate. Um, so this is from iTriage. Um, and everyone is, the majority of Americans are literate, but only 12% are health literate. And most patients, the majority of patients, so 50%, if you look right here, leave their doctor's appointments not knowing what they were told. So it is really, really, really important that we speak more clearly and make sure that they understand. And ways that you can do that is to make sure that you address your language appropriately and make sure that they repeat to you exactly what you said to make sure that they understand what you're saying. And same thing, most adults can't read a drug label. So when you send them home with a medication, you really have to make it clear when you speak with them and when you write out your instructions to them what they need to do. So you need to tell them I need you to take this medication 
twice a day, once in the morning, once in the afternoon, um, by mouth and just keep it as simple as that. Uh, because once they get a prescription, they're not going to be able to tell what's going on. And then these are just major risk factors for poor health literacy uh, to sort of uh, guide you in terms of patients where you really need to be very careful and really make sure that you ask them to say back to you what you told them. Um, so adults over 65, um, racial and ethnic groups other than Caucasians, um, recent refugees and immigrants, uh, people with less than a high school degree or GED, people with uh, low income, and then certainly non-native speakers um, of English is really, really important. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll finish up um, and uh, welcome any questions that you all have. So there are a couple of questions in the chat. Um, I talked about the useful mobile apps. Um, one attendee asked about uh, uh, how to give report efficiently and if you had any recommendations for that. Yeah, um, so the way that I tend to think about report is I'm trying to tell a bit of a story. Um, so patients can have a lot of different medical conditions. Um, and in general, you're trying to give report in a way that provides the information pertinent to that patient to the provider who needs it. And it will vary depending on who you're providing a report to. Uh, but I think that we have a couple good examples of this where you get most of the information um, that is pertinent here. So this patient may have hypertension, may have hyperlipidemia, may have a history of osteoarthritis, et cetera. But what's important to this patient is that he has uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, is on oxygen, and then is coming in with symptoms that are concerning for pneumonia, and we have them on antibiotics, right? I don't add in the other stuff as far as, um, like, by the way, he has osteoarthritis, and we also have him on uh, an NSAID um, or things like that. I try and really dive down into what the patient is presenting for and then provide more supporting information as needed for extra stuff. I hope that makes sense. Thanks. A couple um, just quick, quick uh, comments before people start to log off. Um, we will, again, be sending an email after today's uh, conclusion with the slides that Andrew has presented. We'll also provide the link to the medical terminology quick sheet um, that, that Andrew did supply, but we'll include that in the email. Uh, we'll include the where you can find the link to the recording, which will not be up on our website for, you know, about a week. It takes us a little bit of time to get that up, um, but we will send you the link where that can be found in about a week. A week. Um, and then we'll also send the link to the evaluation for this course. We're already receiving um, wonderful feedback, so thanks for those who commented already. Um, the last question that I saw that I wasn't able to answer was, do you have any... Um, do you have a resource for converting lab values? Oh, yes. Um, so I, I, I wrote those in the link. The one that I really like uh, is the AMA Manual of Style. Um, it basically has all the labs listed and the common things that you want to convert it to. Um, another one that is tends to be useful is uh, Global RPH, uh, which is pretty darn good. Um, and then uh, Google is my best friend, too. I mean, sometimes if you type in into Google just like X with units, convert to whatever, it will often just automatically do it for you. Awesome. And then the last comment, I'll say that um, if you want this link uh, prior to when we can get it up on the website, we can email you that link. But please email me so separately um, because we're getting a lot of uh, requests for that and I, I want to make sure that those who want the want access to this presentation before we can get it on our website have it so please email me I will put my email address in the chat now um, so you all have access to that and uh, I want it to respect everybody's time and Andrew's time so I think we'll end it there but if there are any questions um, you can email me, and if I'm not able to answer them, I will um, send a note to Andrew. But thank you for attending and for your attention and participation. 
Um, Andrew, thanks so much for a great presentation. This was awesome. I learned some things as well. So really appreciate your dedication to this and the amount of time that you spent on the presentation. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you all. And thank you for your engagement. I really appreciate it. It made the presentation a lot, fun, a lot more fun. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day. Bye. Bye, Andrew.